One day I received a text message from a friend, and it went like this. It's a boy. It's all he needed to say. I knew what he meant. I knew where he was. Uh, he was in the hospital. His wife just had a baby, and so he's texting me, and he's pretty excited about this because he was a father of one boy and four girls, and so he finally got his second son, and I was happy for him. My family's kind of the opposite. We had one girl and then seven boys. But anyways, this, uh, so this brother had this boy. You know, we didn't go in to visit him, but I knew if I would have went into the hospital and seen his little baby boy there, it would have pretty much been, you know, all these little beds there in the nursery there in the hospital, and, and they used to do the pink and blue hat thing, so you can tell the boys and the girls out right away. Now they go to the uh, pink and blue stripes, so I guess economy, you know, is down, so save on budget, just make all the hats the same in case they have more boys one year than girls. So they put them all a striped pink and blue hat on. But then this is, this is, tells the difference here. A little tag they'll put on the, on the clear little crib there that says boy or girl. And as you walk into the nursery in this uh, hospital room, that's the only way you know if it's a boy or a girl. Okay, that one's a boy, that one's a girl. That's kind of how it is early on, but it doesn't take long until there's a pretty vast difference between these little infants. Our first child was a girl, and so we had dolls for her to play with. But being a dad that enjoys sports, we had balls and we had tractors and things like that too. But what she did is she would take the dolls and she played mother, and that's, that's what she did. And she was a good little mama. Well, she was three years old, we had our second child, uh, son, and then the Lord has blessed us since then with six more sons. Now, these boys still have the dolls in the toy box, but it's of no interest. These boys go for the, go for the tractors, they go for the balls, and my seventh son, what he would do is, is he would take a ball or he'd take a toy and he'd throw it over the couch, and then he'd run around the other side and get it and throw it back. Now, we never gave him a doll, but I'm confident what he would have done with it would have been abusive. He would have taken the doll, tossed it over the couch, run over and threw it back. You know, they're different. And as they, as they grow older, the difference becomes greater and greater. There really is a difference of, between men and women, boys and girls, not just a physical difference. You know, in our, the USA here, let me give you a few statistics just in starting out here. Changes in our world concerning the role of men and women. In 1950, in the USA... One in three ladies were in the labor force. That's only 33% of women that were employed. In 1998, which is 48 years later, three in five women were in the labor force. That went from 33% to 60%, nearly doubled of the women in the labor force. And 10 years later, in 2008, 48% of the entire labor force was women. So almost half of the labor force was women. Now, I'm not talking about if women should have a job or not. I'm just showing you the difference in how it has changed in our country here. I saw this title one day, a headline news. It says, I love being a man. I thought, hmm, that's interesting. And I was pondering over this topic and working on this book. And uh, so I thought, I'm going to read this. And this comes from... Uh, People.com, October 29, 2009. Now that he's finally in the body he's always felt he belonged in, Chaz Bona says he's enjoying something that took decades to accomplish. It's a long process going back almost a decade. I got clean and sober in 2004, and I couldn't have done this before that, Bona, formerly known as Chastity, tells Entertainment Tonight. Born the daughter of Cher and Sony Bona, Chaz who is 40, has been undergoing a female-to-male sex change since March, a process that has already had significant physical changes on his body. One thing he didn't need changing is his mental and emotional concept of himself as fundamentally male. I always felt like the male from the time I was a child. There wasn't much feminine about me, he says. I believe that gender is something between your ears. That's something I discovered in the early 90s. It was just a long process of being comfortable enough to do something about it. I was turning 40, and I thought it's now or never. I want to still feel vibrant and be able to enjoy my life in a male body and not wait until I'm an old man. 
And that action is accepted in our world today. In fact, where I currently live in Chiang Mai, Thailand, Thailand performs the most sex change surgeries in the world. It's a common thing. Our world has accepted it. Our world thinks it's okay to change what God created. Scripture says, and we're going to look at this just in a moment, God created them male and female. Let me just give you another clipping title. Liberman Breaks Another Basketball Gender Barrier from Dallas. The first woman to play pro basketball with guys is also the first hired to coach them. Hall of Famer Nancy Liberman was introduced Thursday as the head coach of the Dallas Mavericks affiliate in the NBA Development League, which will tip off next November. The D-League team is partially owned by Donnie Average president of basketball operations. Hiring Liber Liberman was his idea, and he's confident young men won't have a problem taking orders from a woman, at least not this woman. She's got the experience. She knows what she's doing. So I certainly hope that we're well beyond those issues, Nelson says. Besides, if you can't respect authority, no matter what form or color it comes in, I don't want you on my team. She's proud to break another gender barrier, one she hopes could be the last barrier. Then she goes on to say, we, I kind of look at President Obama and say, everybody knows it's historic because he's a man of color. But at the end of the day, regardless of race, creed, color, or gender, he has to be president. Everybody knows I'm a woman, but at the end of the day, regardless of my race, creed, color, or gender, I have to win basketball games. Now it's one thing to cross race, creed, and color lines, but it's something totally different to cross gender lines, something that our world has no problem with today, is to cross gender lines. And sad to say, not only is the world accepting this, but the church is following right behind. Genesis 1.26 says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And God created man. He made them in charge over all the earth. Man was not created as an equal with nature, as an equal with animals. God, man was created to, to be in charge of this. Man was given authority. Man is above animals in the earth, not equal. Man was... Man's job is to take care of the earth. And then we go to Genesis chapter 2, where it gives us a more detailed explanation of what happened here. Genesis 2, 15, it says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And drop down to verse 18 of Genesis chapter 2. Verse 18 says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam, who's the first man, to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found and help meet for him. So there's a problem. After all of this creation is done and it's perfect, sin has not entered the world, and God has made Adam, and Adam has the, the job or the privilege to name all these creatures as they're passing by him. And I, you know, I'm not sure how it happened. Did he go around and find them and say, hey, you, you know, we'll call you a dog. Uh, you, know, you, you look like a monkey. You know, or, you know, I don't know. I don't know how he came up with these things. I don't know how he did. Did they pass by him? Did he go to them? And you know, maybe when he saw the dog, he said, you know what? I think you're going to be my best friend here. Man's best friend right there. Uh, spider. None of the ladies will like you. Sorry. I, I don't know. I don't know how he did it or how it went. But everything passed by. And he was lonely. There was no help me for him. Even the monkey passed by. And it's like, relative? Uh-uh. No. And God said, it's not good for man to be alone. Alone? Ah, he's surrounded with animals and creatures. Ah, but there's not a soulmate, a helpmeet for him. And so God says, I'm going to create him and help her. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman 
because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Enter woman. Man was alone, man was lonely, and God created woman. And all the men say, yes, amen. God created man first. He had a job for him. And this is the job that God gave Adam. Adam was to be a leader, provider, protector. Man's job is, you can write this in your notes, man's job is to be leader, provider, protector. That was God's role for him from the beginning. Leader, provider, protector. And as Adam is naming the creatures and he's there and he's alone, God says it's not good for him to be alone. This can be better. So he says, I'm going to make for him and help meet. Now, unfortunately, in our world today, the position or the, the calling of being a lady, and by the way, none of us here today have chose to be born a man or a woman. That's something assigned by God. And unfortunately, today is the role of being a woman has been really looked down on. Unfortunately. But it's a high calling. And maybe it's because we don't understand the different jobs that God has given to men and women. But when God says, I'm going to make for man a helpmeet, let's look at this word where it comes from. The word helpmeet, let's, let's first fill this in. Woman's job is to be a helpmeet, an ideal helper to man. And helpmeet, an ideal helper to man. Now the word help is the same word frequently used in reference to the Lord in Psalms. David often said, the Lord is my helper. So often as he's using this word, help, helper, throughout the Psalms and referring to the Lord, that's the same word that God says, I'm going to make and help me. Okay, that's not degrading at all. In fact, that puts it right up there, right? And that's the word that God says is to refer to women. Thus, it is not a degrading position for the woman. The verb basically means to aid or supply that which the individual cannot provide for himself. And that's where all the women say amen, right? <laughs> to aid or supply that which the individual cannot provide for themselves. The word meat comes from the Hebrew word meaning opposite. So literally, this is meaning according to the opposite of him, meaning that she will correspond and complement the man. She is to be equal and adequate for man, also made in the image of God. I want us to note both man and woman have been created in the image of God. Nothing else was created in the image of God, but man and woman were. There's no difference there, okay? And both man and woman have equal value to God. And we're going to get into that a little more in our second session tonight. But they both have equal value to God. Equal value, but different jobs. Now, as we look at this definition, a woman's job is to be an helpmeet, an ideal helper for man. Now, if you're a woman, you can say, well, great. So my job is to make the man successful, and I'm to make man look good. And we're just kind of, or as a lady, you're just kind of the sidekick, just the helper. And if you do your job, then he looks good, and he gets glory. And, you know, really, my position of a helpmeet really is kind of a lowly, a less than best position. Let's first stop and say, why was man created? Revelation 4.11 says, For thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. See, when God created man, in fact, when God made everything, he did it to bring him glory. Now, I don't know what, what it was like before God created the world. You know, God was there in all his glory and holiness and vast power and greatness. But when God decided to create the world, he did it to bring him glory, and it's rightfully so. And as the creator, when you create something, it brings glory to the creator. Creation brings glory to the creator. So when God created man, he didn't create man. So you know what, man, I want you to go down there, and I want you to really make yourself look good. No. 
Man, and even specifically meaning male here, was created to bring God glory. So now when we come to the woman and her job as a helpmeet, if she is an ideal helper to the man and makes him successful, how is the man successful? When he brings glory to God. So when a woman makes the man successful, the man still isn't supposed to get the glory. It's God. In fact, that's what both men and women are here on this earth to do. We're created to bring God glory. So as a woman, when you are that ideal helper that helped me for a man, really, you're bringing glory to God. And as you make the men in your life successful, whether as a single lady, your father or your employer or your pastor, whether as a married lady, your husband, the men, the, the men in your lives, as you make them successful, you make God look good. You give God glory. And men, as we fulfill our job as being leader, provider, protector, we're not doing it for our attention. We're not doing it for our glory. It's all about God. And see, we've got to get back to saying, why were we created? And it wasn't for our glory. It was for God's glory. And as we fulfill the jobs given to us, which are two different jobs, as we fulfill these jobs, God gets glory. That's what it's all about. We're not talking about a difference in value here. We're not fighting over equality. God created us equal. God created both men and women in his image. Man was created to glorify God, not himself. You see, that's where our world's gone astray. That's why we, we try to say, oh, men and women are the same, and it, you can change from one to the next, or a woman can do the man's job and vice versa, because we're all about getting glory to ourselves. So if we're going to teach this topic well, we've got to go back to the beginning and say, why were we created? To give God glory. And if I'm going to give God glory, then I'm going to have to do what he's called me to do. And God created me to be a man. I didn't choose it. I didn't put that request in. I had nothing to do with that. God gets the most glory possible when men and women fulfill the jobs that God created them to fill. I'd like to look at an example from Scripture. I'm going to go to Genesis 15 and 16. You can turn there if you'd like. I'm going to basically tell what's happening here. Maybe read a few verses in Genesis 16. Look at an example in Scripture where the jobs that God gave for the man to be leader, provider, protector, and the job of the woman to be the ideal helper or a helpmeet where they were not followed. And we're going to look at the destruction that followed this. In Genesis 15, God promised Abraham, or God had promised Abraham that he's going to make of him a great nation. He promised him that in Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis 15, we come to place, and he still has no children. You know, he had been told to look at the sky, and you see the stars. Can you count them? Abraham, no, I can't count them. He says, well, your descendants are going to be more than the stars. Count the sand by the seashore. Can't count that. That's going to be your descendants. Well, that sounds exciting, but if you've got no children, hey, when you and your wife die, it's done. It, so something's got to work here. Something's got to change. God promised Abram a son. Well, Abraham didn't have a son yet, and he's getting old, and his wife is getting old. And he said this to God. He said, you know what? Eliezer, my servant, he can be my heir. He can be the one who carries on my name, and that's how this is to be fulfilled. God said, no, 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 not Eliezer. Yeah, good servant, but it's not going to be through him. You're going to have a son. And Genesis 15 says, Abraham believed God. It's going to happen. We come to chapter 16. And I like to read the first six verses of Genesis chapter 16. It says this, Now Sarah, Abram's wife, bare him no children. She had an handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said unto Abram, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid, it may be that I may obtain children by her. So in the legal customs then, because she couldn't have any children, Abraham could get her servant pregnant, and she can bear this child, and it can be their heir. And so she can have this child, and it'll be carry on the seed for, for Abraham and Sarah here. And it says in verse 2, And Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarah. Sarah says, there's a problem. Something's not happened. This is what we need to do. Ideal helper, 
or leader. She's leading out here, but no harm is done until it says, Abram hearkened to the voice of his wife. Leader, provider, protector, submissive. Yeah, Abraham, you're being submissive. Now, look how quickly the tone of this story changes. And Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, verse 3, after Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarah said unto Abraham, My wrong be upon thee. Time out. Now, if I'm Abraham, I say, Stop. This was not my idea. You told me to do this, and now you're like, my wrong be on you. What happened? What happened? There's a reversal of jobs here. Abraham hearkened to the voice of his wife. You see, as you read through the rest of this, the story is bad. It's a sad story of what happens, the strife between Sarah and, and Hagar, her her servant, and then for Abraham, who now he has a son, Ishmael, and yet God says, no, it's not going to be. I'm going to give you a son, like I said, through Sarah. And yet Ishmael is his son, so he loves him, and yet he's got to send him away. And oh, the strife in this family over what has happened. Abraham, why weren't you leader, provider, protector? You could have protected your wife and protected her handmaid from this strife. But you didn't. Not a good story. There is a reversal of job. The woman giving the command, the man hearkening. Sarah taking authority or leadership. And Abram submitting. One of the great, great temptations for man. I want you to write this in your notes here. One of the great temptations for man, as in male, is to be passive and pleasing instead of leader, provider, protector. One of the great temptations for man is to be passive and pleasing. I don't want any strife. Sarah, if you think this is best, yeah, that's fine. I face that temptation as a man, as a leader in my home. Sometimes I don't really have an opinion on something, and my wife says this or my children say this, and the temptation is there just to be passive, not to be the leader, just to please instead of saying what is best and being a protector like Abram failed here. One of the great temptations for man is to be passive and pleasing instead of leader, provider, protector. One of the great temptations for women is to be controlling and domineering instead of submissive and respectful. It's no coincidence that the job God gave to man, the job that God gave to woman, the great temptation we face is to cross these up. One of the great temptations for women is to be controlling and domineering instead of submissive and respectful. You know what the end result is of this story? This is what verse 12 of Genesis 16 says. As the Lord was saying, this is what Ishmael is going to be. It says, he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him. That's where the descendants of Muslims come from today. And our world is pretty much at war against the descendants of Ishmael today. How did that all happen? A man being passive and pleasing. A woman being domineering and controlling. Men and women not fulfilling the job like God had intended for them to fill. God created us, men and women, in his image. He created us with a purpose. If God only wanted men, he would have just made men. But no, he said it's not good for man to be alone. I'm going to make him a helper. I'm going to make him a help me, an ideal helper. God made women, God made men and women both, both in the image of God, both created equal, but they have separate jobs. And we need to fulfill those jobs today. Our world today has made progress, at least I should say this country, has made progress in realizing the sacredness of race. 
See, there was a day in this country when we believed your value was based on your color, your race. And if your color was this color, you're a master. If it's that color, you're a slave. But our country today realizes, no, all race, all colors are equal in God's image. We acknowledge there is a sacredness in race. This is actually big news right now in this country, especially in the sports world, caught our president's attention because just in the past week, a wealthy businessman, a sports owner, made a statement that got public telling someone, I don't want you to bring any one of these minorities to my basketball games. This guy is the owner of an NBA basketball team. And he said, I don't, I don't want you to bring any minorities to my basketball games. You know, it's okay if you hang out with them. Don't bring them to my games. And what he was doing is he was speaking against blacks. And somehow this got public. And the whole NBA was in an uproar about this. How can this guy do this? His coach of the team he owns is black. All of his players but two are black. Why is he doing this? And our country acknowledges that's wrong. There is a sacredness of race. Even the president speaks out against that. Everybody's in an uproar about this. And you know what? Our world is right. There's something wrong with that. But do you know what? Our world will acknowledge a sacredness of race, but not a sacredness of sex, of gender. You see, our country is fast making it legal from state to state to state for same-sex marriage. God created male and female. Our, our country says it's okay now to have an operation so you can be changed from a male to a female. And if you are to speak out against one man and one woman making up marriage, if you speak against homosexuality, people stand up and say, that's wrong, you can't do that. But if you speak against one race, oh, you can't do that, that's sacred. Listen to me, people. Yes, race is sacred, so is gender. God created men and women different. He gave them each jobs. And for us to say, no, we can cross those lines. We can change sex. We can say, no, marriage isn't to be one man and one woman. It's whatever you want. That's wrong. God created men and women different. He gave different jobs. And God's going to get the most glory when we as men and women fulfill the jobs he's given us. For us men, that's to be leader, provider, protector. For women, that's to be an helpmeet, an ideal helper for man. 